All right, and I welcome back to the Good Morning Ninja show. And uh, we still stay here because we get a lot of things stuff on now. And we promise on ourselves we will bring some better conversation to now. Seeing the fact that uh, the federal government don't talk, say they want, uh, you know, they, they um, allow some uh, graduating students go back to school and, uh, you know, put a little boost to the educational sector as it be. So because due to coronavirus, everybody don't the house. A lot of things have been on hold. So uh, today we're going to be joined by uh, two um, um, in, in individuals. This now. Uh, women within to the educational sector also, uh, Mrs. Uh, Oyikon Ajala and uh, Mrs. Adesheke Odojukon. They are both uh, proprietors of schools, and we're going to be having a conversation. How has coronavirus affected the educational system, and what are the things, you know, the things being put in place uh, moving forward from here as the situation may be? They are very welcome uh, to the show, madams. Hello. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, so as the... as the uh, Sorry, before we go on, my name is Oyiko Afolabi, not Ajala. Okay, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Oyiko Afolabi, right. thank That's you very fine. much for that correction. Thank you very much. Okay. So as it is now, uh, it's the big situation is here. Uh, uh, educational, the educational system or the, has been on hold due to coronavirus. And a lot has been going on. So would 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 like to even hear from 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 your side. How has it been so far? And uh, what are the plans being put in place moving forward? Let's start from there. Um. So I'll go first. Yes, ma'am. Please. The educational system has been affected by coronavirus. I must say, mm -hmm. there isn't a doubt about that. But we would not say that it has been put on hold completely. Okay. It has just brought out, it's just made us more innovative with learning. It's had its ups and its downs. The upside is that, unlike before, there wasn't a lot of virtual learning going on, particularly in Nigeria, in Nigerian schools. But now, even from the early years, all the way up to the tertiary institutions, we are now learning to teach virtually and to learn virtually. The teachers are learning, parents are learning, children are learning. So that's the good side. That's a good thing that has come out of it. Mm. Now, you so, you um, okay, go, go ahead. I wanted to uh, pick up from a conversation you said regarding e-learning. And uh, that has also been a concern from the side of the parents now. You know, it's been a concern that, okay, what if we are not, uh, it, it's, it, we know that uh, it's not all Nigerians or uh, majority of Nigerians are not uh, uh, privileged to internet service and things like that. So that has also affected the learning process. So as, as, uh, as you mentioned that, how successful has that been and how acceptable has that been from uh, the parents' perspective regarding this? Well... It's been a challenge for some parents, there's no doubt about it. But we find ways around it. Now, there are the public schools, there are the state schools, and the private schools. For some parents, I must admit that it's been expensive, but I guess it's also expensive to buy fuel and take children to school, to pack, uh, to pack their lunch bag and all of that. So it's been a bit of sacrifice on everybody's part. All right. Now, okay. there's some... Oh, go, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yes. There's some children that we've had to support. The school has had to support, no doubt about it. And the state governments too have been very helpful with the radio stations and the television stations that children have relied upon for learning. So we are making moves. We are... I mean, there's a bit of progress. It's not been hands down completely. All right, then I'd like to hear from uh, Mrs. Adeseke Odojukon. Is that the same um, situation with you? Because we know that some schools have embraced the concept of e-learning, but in some schools, the parents have totally fought against it. Has the impact been on your end as well, and uh, how are the parents reacting to this? Thank you very much. Um, the educational sector has been the, one of the biggest um, casualties of this um, corona um, pandemic. And so, um, in, out of every out of every bad situation, you always find a solution. You know, um, things cannot be put on hold forever. And so, in in my own case, you know, my uh, my own parents have um, have been able to manage. Some are, you know, are online with us, and some aren't. Maybe because um, they have to go to work, 
and they cannot, um, they don't have anybody to help um, put the children online for e-learning. Some can't because according to them, they cannot afford the, um, the expenses of um, going online almost every day. And then with the state schools, you know, the Honorable Commissioner for Education has made it very easy, you know. There, there are TV stations, um, state TV stations and radio stations. And, um, you know, in some cases, those parents who cannot afford, um, maybe when there is no light or something like that, you know, um, there are situations where, you know, um, some of these schools put some um, materials, some educational materials into files and have the parents come to pick it up from the, from the school gates to make things easy for them. All right. And you mentioned that in your case, some parents yes. have been open to the idea. Some parents haven't been open to the idea. I mean, it's fantastic that we are one of the stations that do the online learning as we have TV lessons as S3 every day of the week from 2 p.m. to 4 yeah. p.m. But yes. in the cases where the parents are not open to it, what happens to the students? Because we are finding that some students would then advance faster than the other students in terms of you know, the educational syllabus. So what happens? Because they, will not, they won't be able to play catch-up for the ones who, who are not learning at this very time. And like I said earlier, you know, there are some schools, there are some schools that, you know, put educational materials into files and ask these children to come to the school gate to pick these things up to the gate. So they use this, they, they take the, the materials home, study with it, and then take it back for the teacher to pick up because um, in some of these schools, one or two teachers go to the schools to pick these materials up and mark them and, and take them back to the gates. And the children come back to pick it. And then also, children have to learn on their own, you know, mm. with, the, um, with the guidance of their parents. You know, children have to learn on their own. Yeah. Now, now speaking about... Yes. So speaking about, you mentioned the, um, with the guidance of their parents, uh, because now it shows that the parents have uh, a big role to play in the child's learning process. Usually, uh, it's before uh, coronavirus, it's the child goes to school, the teacher handles that, the child comes back. Maybe the parents will just supervise what the child had done uh, the whole day, but it's the, the, the parents is not usually the one in the forefront, you know, making sure that the child is learning at that time. And in a case where these parents don't have the learning and um, the, the the ability to teach a child properly as to what uh, the teacher will do in the class uh I, I believe that's one of the reasons why most of these parents are not uh, would not really um be open to the um e-learning or home learning process so as 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 the school what have there been any other ways to to see you know to, to check if the child is actually progressing from them um, learning uh, via the e-learning process Indeed, there. Okay, so okay. I believe that uh, Dewa was addressing that question to um, Mrs. Adeleke, following up from what she had. Mrs. Mrs. Adeleke, Adeleke, I beg yes. your pardon. Following up from what she following said. Up from what she has said. Yes. So I would, would like to know: Are there like measures that uh, the school would put in place to to check, to monitor if the child is really making progress at home? Yes. You, uh, if, with parents who cannot, with parents who cannot afford the. Um, e-learning um, um, process. Um, sometimes we are magnanimous enough to um, help, I mean, you know, buy um, um, data for some of these parents. And um, in some cases, some, we use text messages to, you know, speak to, um, um, to our, some of our children, even phone calls. We do the calling, we call the children to find out how they are doing. You know, because I mean, if, if children cannot afford, I mean, parents cannot afford these things, we as the um, school owners and teachers should be able to help out, you know. So some schools are helping parents with data and making phone calls to ensure that these children are learning. All right. Um, Mrs. Oniko, I'd like to ask you a question, but I don't know, I, I figure that you might want to chip in on what uh, Mrs. Adek, as I said, had just said. Are there some things you'd like to say before I proceed to my next question? Yes, I would like to add that they are in an ideal situation, parents should always support children in their learning. Mm -hmm. That's going on now. Now we are finding that parents are more involved, which is one of the positive things that, have, that has come out of this pandemic. Like Mrs. Ms. Shaker said, the teachers support. 
we help them with um, devices, we send um, data home, we have had to buy phones for some children. And also children who need extra support, just like we do in school where a child is called aside to help a child who is struggling with learning. We also do that even during the virtual learning. So children have the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one with their teachers where they can make a phone call, like she said earlier, and teachers talk them through challenges that they might have in their learning process. Fantastic. Let's talk about now the real financial impact of COVID-19 on the education sector. The fact that COVID-19 is in our country does not mean that the teachers will not eat, the proprietors will not eat, and every staff of the school will not eat. So give us an insight into how the school, uh, the, the school has been able to survive in this season, regardless of the fact that income hasn't been coming in as much as it should have. I must admit that it has been very challenging. Um, we have had the support of some parents who have signed their children on, so that has been some income. We've had to be very considerate and sacrificial with our teachers because, I mean, like you, like you just said, the teachers have to survive. We've had to dig into our savings to keep them going because um, it's all the time to just say, go back home and just wash your hands clean and just sit down. No, we have to think of different ways of ensuring that we make some money and we keep the teachers going. Uh, the virtual learning has helped. We haven't been able to pay 100% salaries to the teachers, but we have been, some of us have been able to pay something substantial to keep them going. Even the parents have had to suffer for this. It's affected them financially, so we have to be considerate. Uh, we're all working together. It's something that has affected everybody. And we all just have to be considerate. When your teachers and staff see that you're doing your best to ensure to take care of their welfare, you're considerate, then um, we all just have to swim through by his grace. You know, it's very difficult, honestly, to imagine and to think about how teachers and the proprietors and even the school bus driver and the gate man at the school and all these people have to feed during this season because at the end of the day, no money is coming in, but they must be paid. And I'd like to address my next question to Mrs. Adeseke. And I'm asking, there are many sectors that are asking for bailouts. You know, we're asking yeah. for bailouts. We've, we've had the airlines asking for bailouts or else they say their businesses will suffer. How do you, do you believe that the educational sector is one that needs a bailout? And if yes, how do you think the government should go about this? And I'm sure I'll be addressing this question to both of you. Okay. Um, you know, like I, like I mentioned earlier, um, the educational sector has been one of the biggest um, uh, casualties of this um, pandemic. And unfortunately for us, that, you know, there was a 50 billion subvention uh, fund from the CBN. And unfortunately for us, the educational sector was not part of it. And so it would be nice if the government could, um, could um, speak to that, could address that. Because, I mean, other sectors were involved. I mean, education, I mean, um, agriculture and some other manufacturing and other sectors. But the educational sector was left out, you know. So if the government could, you know, bail, help to bail the, the educational sector out, it would be nice. Because abroad, you know, the um, governments, in some countries abroad have, you know, helped uh, put, uh, the educational sector out. They've helped in paying salaries, I mean, for um, for the teachers and, and so on. So, but in our own case, it's not, it's, not, it's not so. So if the government could look into it, it would be nice, you know. And I wanted to speak to what uh, Mrs. Um, Afalabi um, spoke about, about, um, you know, it's not all schools that, that, um, have been able to sail through this pandemic. Some schools have not been able to pay their staff salaries since um, closed down in March. You know, so things have really been tough for for teachers. You know, so that's the case. In some, in some. Okay. Um, it, 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 okay. It's 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 good that we were able to you know identify how the government can be uh, can play a part in helping to um, ease up the, the the pressure and stress on the educational sector. So, but uh, some there's there's been conversations about uh, from parents who also say that uh, some of the schools are not even helping out. Like uh, they are still bringing up 
um, fees and different kind of uh, um, um, costs that they need to pay, and some parents are complaining that they don't have money coming in, they need the schools to probably cut down in these periods. If it's this period, let's cut down and uh, let's see how we can still stay afloat. And maybe when we're, the economy is back to normal, Everything's can, uh, can, <laughs> everything can fall in place. So I believe that uh, both of you can actually shed a little bit of light on that part. Has this been a case or a conversation from any parent or the parents you, um, who um, work with you? Well, I guess every school is peculiar. Okay. And the parents and the relationship that you have with your parents differs from school to school. What is key is that school owners, all stakeholders must sit down and communicate. There must be communication. You must kind of do together, do a needs assessment. If you all sit down and you're very open, then parents know what the school can afford to compromise on. And um, the school also understands that every parent is different. You find that some parents cannot there's children that we're buying devices for, who, have, who their parents have paid their school fees in the past, and now we're having to buy them phones and data. And there's some parents who say, you know what, I see what you've been doing, I'd like to support you, and I'm going to do this or do that. So I think it all boils down to communication and the peculiarity of your school. Mm. Okay, mm. so, so you're, you're suggesting that some sort of virtual PTA meeting be held? Oh, and yes. Teachers, and then they can all come together collectively to suggest a decision. Definitely. Okay, I uh, earlier well, asked uh, Mrs. Ododu about what the government can do to, to support the education, educational sector. And I'd like you to ask this, I'd like you to answer the same question. You know, and, and I know that we have the government schools, the private institutions, and there may be arguments, you know, in this case as to who will need it most, who will need it less. So uh, I'd like to ask you, Mrs. Afolabi, uh, what you think are some of the things that the government can do, some of the ways in which the government can go about this. And I'm directing this to Mrs. Oyinko Afolabi. I believe that the government needs to support all the children. Every child matters. And in this, during this pandemic, we all, every child needs the support. The children in the state schools, the children in the public school. Now the percentages may differ, but the private schools have to be supported. The private schools, too, they are struggling. The state schools, they definitely need the support of the government. They are relying completely on the government, and the government needs to support them. There are countries where teachers are being paid their full salaries, even the private schools. I spoke to a colleague a few days ago. She said that the, the, the government in the UK, that the government is helping them. And so she's able to keep, you know, promising and delivering to her staff. If we had that assurance in Nigeria, it would make life easier for staff and also the children. Okay. Uh, my final question to the both of you would be to talk to the parents, you know, and parents in the sense of what are some of the tips you would give to them. Some of them have had to be their children's teachers. Thankfully, you know, thanks to you and your organizations and what you and some of your staff have done in terms of giving out content. But like Adewa had asked earlier, some parents are practically clueless when it comes to helping their children with assignments. Some of them go to work come back, mm -hmm. they pay the lesson teacher to help these children. So this will be the first time that many parents have to do this with their children. And truthfully, they're struggling. So I'd like the both of you to actually give words of advice or share some tips and some words of encouragement. And uh, I think I'll start with Mrs. Um, Afolabi and then move over to Mrs. Um, Ade, uh, Mrs. Ojodukon. Well, I'll just say to parents that this is a time that they have to be very patient with their children. They need to understand that even as children, they are going through the pressure and the stress of this pandemic. Uh, everything is not normal. There, there is instability. There's a, they need to talk to their children, understand how they are feeling, and then as much as possible, support them however they can with their learning. Now, um, we must understand that not every parent is able to, to help their child. 
it might be lack of knowledge it might be lack of um technical knowledge or even content you know but they can give emotional support and if they need help we're just a phone call away we're all here to support the, the family not only the children now it's the whole family that the school has to support and so parents should not hesitate to call out to their teachers if they need help whether with their children's learning or even emotions uh, we're here for them hmm. interesting all right and for you mrs Odredukon? yes um schooling is a is a partnership it's a partnership between uh, parents and um, and um, teachers. So I, I believe that if I mean I mean like when you said we're a phone call away. I mean the parents can call us. We can give advice, help these children with their assignments. I'm ready to do it, for you, and I'm sure when you talk to is is ready to offer her services to um, to these parents. So I mean if there are any issues, parents should be able to I mean call call on us. We should be able to give our own you know help. To these kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Then, uh, what about uh, advice to the teachers? Seeing the fact that uh, some of them, like you said, uh, do it. Like uh, they, we, we earlier spoke about, some of not being paid salaries. Some of them are still uh, very, very um, confused on the way forward. Seeing the fact that we don't know how coronavirus, how long this pandemic is going to last. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's quite difficult for the teachers also. So what would you say, how, how can you encourage the, the teachers to be, uh, to stay steadfast and probably move forward in this situation? Yeah, Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. Odojikon, please you, go ahead. Go ahead, madam. For me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So we're asking, we're, we're asking, asking both of you. So you can, you can just... So uh, talk to your, to your teachers and to your fellow proprietresses and proprietors. Well, some words well, of encouragement. Well, you know, um, as we've heard, some, some teachers are already doing some work with their children online. They, I mean, they should try and be innovative, try and make the best out of this uh, bad situation, you know. Bad situations don't last for long. They should try and be innovative and just find something else to do and uh, maybe you know just find a way to um, get around it and then also we as uh, school owners we uh, try to help um, some of our teachers by sending them just a bit of stipends food stuff and all, all sorts of things just to um, help them bear this situation and also i think that the, gov the government should try and call all stakeholders together in order to um, come out with a, a solution to this issue so that no one suffers. Hmm. All right, all right. Thank you very much, And then to Mrs. Afolabi. Uh, to Mrs. Afolabi, any words for the teachers? Uh, I think this is a good time for teachers to be learning as well. New skills and gaining more knowledge. They need to start preparing now for post-COVID. Um, uh, most of our teachers, we're sending them on trainings. The trainings are not very expensive. Some are expensive, some are not. But um, they're learning too many things now on how to uh, put together a short video, how to do, share their screen, just how to teach things that, skills that they didn't require before COVID-19. They have gained a lot of skills that will become useful, that, that they can even start using virtually now. So they can be in Nigeria, and be teaching children in other parts of the world from their bedrooms, from their living rooms. So it's time for them to make use of those opportunities that have come in. We need to not focus on only the downside of this pandemic. We must be intentional about getting the benefits and developing skills, gaining knowledge during this period. Fantastic. I, and that's a very, very wonderful suggestion you made there. There are countries in the world where people make money just from being able to teach English language online. There are some countries where there are many people who want to learn English. So teachers can look for these opportunities to teach online and then even make extra cash for themselves. Very, very uh, uh, innovative one there. But before we go, we had talked earlier about how the federal government had said that they'll be reopening schools just for a month, say from now to the 27th of July. And they're doing this just for uh, graduating students. So um, GSS3, SS3 and primary five students so that they can go back to school and take their exams. 
Uh, are we ready for this? And, and how ready do you think, uh, what are some of the steps that uh, schools like yourself, organizations like yourself are putting in place to get ready to welcome them back to school, even if it's just for a month? Okay. Who is that question directed at? Okay, it's it's okay, directed to both, both of you. you can so go ahead you can first. go ahead since you're then here. Then we'll uh, have a... Oh, okay. You can take that, and then we'll, we'll take one last one with Mrs. Um, Odojukon. Odojukon. Okay. So in preparing for the children to come back to school, the children in the exam classes, I think we need to work our way through from right from home. So we'll start like a needs assessment. What does the child need to do before planning before a child leaves home? Have you already um, explained to your child? Does your, is your child aware of all the precautions that needs to be taken before leaving the house? Is your child fit to leave the house in good health condition? emotionally has your child gets to school what's the process between home and school who brings the child to school is the car sanitized does the child know that i must have depending on the age of the child does the child know that i must have my mask on all the time i must try as much as possible to keep my hands to myself to not to sneeze in other people's faces um to sanitize and wash my hands as often as possible now, when the child has all that information before leaving home, what happens when the child gets to the school gate? Is the gate man prepared? Has it been given the proper orientation? Mm -hmm. Has the school environment been prepared to welcome the child? Has it been sanitized? Um, are there markings? Does the child understand social distancing? When people enter the school, can they see and are they reminded that we're all being careful here? So there's have your mask on signs all over the place. There, there are um, stickers around saying that um, maintain social distancing. Um, the, the, the classroom, have they been rearranged? The teachers and the staff, right from the cleaners all the way to the head of school, have they had the proper orientation to handle children coming back to school? So. Um, are they prepared? Are they cleaning as often as they need to clean? Is somebody checking that the cleaning is going on? Are the children involved in the um, hygiene process of the school? What are the plans if a child is ill or a member of staff is ill? The teaching styles will it have to change. The number of children in the class, will they have to be reduced? The sitting arrangement, uh, the, the classroom conditions, all of that has to be put in place. And these are very, Policies very have to come valid up. questions and valid concerns that we there must take. There has to be school improvement. Mm -hmm. yes. A lot, a lot all has of to that change. Has a to lot of that place. has to change. And finally, Mrs. Ojodukon, uh, bearing, into mind, uh, bearing in mind all these conversations that will come into place, uh, Mrs. Ojodukon, do you think that we are ready yet to receive students back to school? Um, we're not ready. I don't think we're ready. But, um, you know, like um, Oyeko has said, um, the schools will have to uh, make sure that um, um, the correct measures are put in place to um, ensure the safety and health of the children and even the staff. You know, she has said it all. And um, if um, the schools, the school management can, you know, imbibe all what she has said, then it will be good. I don't know about the government schools, but you know, if they can, you know, put in, put in all those measures in place, things will, will work out well. But everybody has to be um, safety conscious. All right. Mm. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your time. It's very, it's been very, very uh, insightful, and I believe that with these conversations we've had, uh, the, the teachers, the parents, the government, everybody involved, even the children, everybody involved in this educational process, they know and they play their part well. Thank you very much for being with us on the show. Thank you very, Thank you very much. To so enjoy more of these our Ugonke videos, when you just watch. Press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.